Today I'll be talking about empowerment on the level of the individual and the political through the pedagogy of creative writing. It's not an exaggeration to say that poetry fundamentally changed the way I communicate with others. When I first came to NYU, I was very shy, eager and excited to be here, but quiet, reserved nonetheless. After taking several creative writing workshops and poetry workshops, by my sophomore year, I was in a poetry class where I brought in a poem called Boiling Point. And because the creative writing class creates a dynamic between the community of writers in the class to recognize each other as individuals, my peers were able to notice a definitive shift in my work, that I was no longer writing passively about what had been done to me, but rather what I was doing as a person with agency. Because this was such a profound change in my own thinking, I wanted to see how I could incorporate creative writing pedagogy into my Gallatin concentration. So I want to talk about for a second how poetry was first established into academia. Eric Bennett in his book pens that in 1936, the first creative writing MFA program started in Iowa, shipping poets and creative writers off into the patriotic cornfields to produce American narratives as an anti-communist tactic. This institutionalization of creative writing gave a sense of value to an individual's experience, bringing it into the classroom and putting it on par with academic text. So if you've ever taken a workshop, you might have heard the phrase, show, don't tell, which is also emblematic of this same emphasis on one's experience rather than adherence to any particular philosophy or dogma. So, and these, these pillars of democracy still ring true in our creative writing classes today. I like to break it down into three main pillars. So the first, when you look at this photo, can you tell who is the professor and who are the students? Probably not, as the, the physical circular structure of the class allows equal emphasis on every student physically to be represented equally in the space. There's also a horizontal powered structure going on in the class from peer to peer and peer to professor. Secondly, there's an emphasis on students bringing in their own experience into the classroom as they become drivers of the class curriculum. Whatever they bring into the class, we use as the text for our class. There's also an emphasis on writing prolifically as week after week, students bring in a new poem, a new chapter to their story. So Marie Ponceau in her book, Beat Not the Poor Desk, best frames this by saying people enjoy producing something of their own. Once relieved of the suspicion, they may be doing it the wrong way. So by allowing students to bring in their own lived experiences, we want to encourage them to, to share with others and to alleviate any sense of dissatisfaction with their own work. And third, and perhaps most importantly, we aim to create a community of individuals. This comes in the form of allowing a student to project their own voice rather than asking them to assimilate to a professor's voice or to a writer you think they sound like. So in our critiques, we refrain from saying, oh, I like or I dislike. And instead, we want to say, this was effective because or this worked and why, to really allow the student to take up space with their own voice. Three experiences I've had at Gallatin have helped shape my understanding of creative writing pedagogy. The first was at University Settlement, a, a facility in the Lower East Side that teaches creative writing, along with many other things, to adult learners. So it's an adult literacy center. And I was fortunate enough to teach alongside June Foley, where we taught a creative writing workshop to recently immigrated folks who were learning English. The students brought in their essays and poems on anything from proposing to their partner to being discriminated against at a restaurant. And if the students were, were to bring in um, a sentence on a semicolon, for example, or if their sentence had quotation marks, we would take that sentence, put it up on the board, and perhaps teach a mini lesson on punctuation or how to use a semicolon. So again, the students become the drivers of the curriculum. Their work becomes the text that we use in the classroom. One student even brought in a letter that she had written after an incident at her workplace where someone had stolen a lot of merchandise on fake credit. And instead of having to go through a translator or have her story told secondhand, she was able to use writing as the vehicle to her own empowerment and was able to get the legal help that she needed quickly. The second experience that I had was while on the Dean's Award for Summit Research, looking at the recent emergence of creative writing programs in China. Um, so as you can see, they're popping up in many of the major cities. 
And this is a huge shift in, in educational pedagogy as we think of the original MFA program starting in Iowa as an anti-communist tactic and now is popping up in a communist country. But the pillars of individualism still ring true in this classroom as well. Um, I was looking at Sun Yat-sen University where the class, a lot of the, the kids in the class actually took the class because they were so intrigued as to how such a structure would work. Where one in which you bring your own personal experience in and you have a responsibility in driving the class forward. So there were topics that were covered in this class that may be a bit more taboo to talk about in public space. Um, students felt comfortable within this community that they had created to talk about issues such as domestic violence or LGBTQ issues. And they were able to write about them and share them openly and freely. But with any new structures, there always comes challenges. Um, I went to City University of Hong Kong, which unfortunately the program was shut down just last year, as Hong Kong continues to look more towards mainland, not only in terms of politics, but also in terms of STEM fields and science and technology publishing. So the students here, unfortunately, did not get the chance to have this program um, for more than four years, as um, the English department head who was hired was not proficient in English, and therefore there was a lack of emphasis on the liberal arts. So the, the program was unfortunately shut down last year. Which brings me to my third experience. Um, I was fortunate enough to be interning at PEN America. PEN America is an NGO that helps protect persecuted poets, writers, and authors around the world. While I was there, I was working mainly on Hong Kong cases, as the situation with free speech continues to get more precarious. The fact that PEN America is needed so desperately in so many areas of the world is a testament to how creative writing is able to galvanize the sentiments of the public and make them think for themselves, make them compare the story and think, is my political regime similar? Am I experiencing the same versions of oppression? Am I enjoying the same happiness, the same freedom? And that scares governments. But that's not to say that there were no instances of free speech at these universities. At Hong Kong Baptist University, I was really amazed to see that the first um, student-led literary publication was actually themed on Hong Kong's self-determination. Um, as well, there, there weren't a whole lot of opportunities in mainland China, at least, to take these narratives outside of the classroom and um, share stories at open mics or public readings at bookstores, like we might have surrounding our MFA programs here. But NYU Shanghai actually started a really cool initiative where they started doing a bilingual reading series where they bring together Chinese poets and authors and pair them with an English-speaking faculty member. And together they work on a translation of the work um, and are able to share it with the university, which is a really cool, awesome thing that they're doing, um, but obviously takes a lot of time, a lot of resources. Um, but regardless if these stories ever make it outside of the university or the classroom, there's so much inherent value in the lessons to be learned in such a pedagogy, that students are able to create a community is such a radical act in itself. To have someone listen to you every week, to have them empathize with your story. You know, I think of the students at Sun Yat-sen University and perhaps that it might have been the first time that someone has heard an instance of domestic violence or has met a queer person and has been able to put a face to what our governments make political. So, I want to encourage you to share your stories. Share them with your friends, your family at the dinner table, people in the grocery line, your professors, um, and, and hopefully one day your politicians. So thank you. <laughs>